Okay, um, you know, today as Ming pointed out, right, it's the start of a, a brand new series, okay, which I'm, uh, I've, um, um, I'll be talking about uh, in the next uh, four months um, on Singaporean art. Um, and there'll be four themes or tracks right, in this uh, series. Uh, painting, and then the next um, theme will be on uh, sculpture, and then uh, on contemporary ink painting, and we wrap it up with contemporary art. Right? So there'll be uh, one kind of uh, theme per month. Okay. And we're going to kick off with, uh, I suppose, an art form that all of us are familiar with, which is painting. And it's also an art form, I suppose, which uh, has dominated right, Singaporean art, you know, uh, for most part of the 20th century. Um, now, before, you know, I hope to have, um, you know, some discussion, right, uh, you know, either in the course of the lecture or towards the end, okay, because I suppose there are, there are you know, a couple of uh, debates now surrounding painting. For example, the question as to whether painting is dead, right, at least in Singapore. Okay, so, you know, perhaps, I'd like to hear your views as well, okay, on this uh, issue. Um, now, how many of you have, uh, okay, there was a recent uh, exhibition which has, you know, recently closed, all right, at the uh, National Museum, okay, it's called A Change World, okay, that's an exhibition on uh, uh, painting in Singapore from the 1950s to the 1970s, it was a parallel event, okay, of the uh, uh, Singapore Biennale 2013. How, can I have a show of how many of you have uh, actually seen that show, the exhibition? Hmm, okay, not, not, too, not too bad, can be better, <laughs> right? Um, now for those who have seen that show, well, you know, you have seen, uh, I suppose, uh, quite a good show in terms of, I suppose, the works that have been shown, right? Because there were easily a couple of hundred works, okay, and many of them, uh, you know, uh, have been shown for the first time. Okay, and 1950s to 1970s was really the peak of Singaporean painting. Okay. And, um, but I suppose uh, one glaring omission from that show okay, um, is the absence of sculpture. Okay, as far as I, I recall, there were only two um, sculptural works in that show. Right? Not that there's a lack of a sculpture scene in Singapore. You know, in my next uh, talk, Right, I'm going to um, you know uh, uh, talk on the um, you know the, the theme of sculpture, right? But I suppose there's uh, there are not many sculptures I suppose in our own national collection, okay? At least those that have uh, they are they have predated 1970, okay? Many of them are actually with the families of art of the of the sculptors, right? Rather than in the national collection, okay? So I suppose we. Um, I mean, the National Gallery, you know, um, they are building up, they know that this is a gap in the collection and they have recognised that and they are, you know, building up this uh, aspect of their collection. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to take a chronological approach. Okay, I think that's the best way to talk about, right, the history of uh, Singaporean painting. Okay, because that will give you a kind of understanding, okay, as to how uh, Singaporean painting developed, right, over the years over the course of about, about a century or so. Right? I mean, compared to other um, you know, countries, right, the history of uh, painting here in Singapore right, is um, relatively short. Right? I mean, as you know, you know Singapore was a, a fishing village. Right? Um, I don't know whether these people painted, okay, but if they did, whether they painted on pottery or not, okay, we have no material evidence. Right? But compared to, let's say, a civilization like China, I mean, painting goes back, you know, thousands of years ago, right? In Europe, they have found evidence of painting in the caves, okay? But in Singapore, you know, the earliest evidence of painting that we have, okay, goes back, uh, I suppose, only to the 19th century. Okay, and um, now I slightly changed, uh, very slight changes, right, to, to, the, to my PowerPoint slide. So, uh, it, it, it might not correspond, you know, um, with, with what you have, okay, but more or less, I think generally, right, it should correspond, okay, to the printed version. Yes, and I think, you know, we, you know, the, 
one of the earliest uh, kind of evidence of painting in Singapore, okay, um, you know, can be seen in the works of uh, so-called artists, right, in the 19th century. Okay, and these artists were mainly, I would say, travelers, sojourners. Okay, uh, now when I when I mean travelers or sojourners, I mean they were here only for a short time. Okay, some of them were really travelers who just you know happened to pass by Singapore. Um, others were, in fact, uh, officials of the East India Company, right? The East India Company. Um, you know, others were members of scientific and exploratory expeditions. Okay. Now, some of these artists were, of course, uh, professionals. Okay, for example, um, some of the French expeditions, they have on board okay, professional artists okay, whose job was to record you know, the kind of the, the landscape and the topography of Singapore. Right? And um, some of the officials of the East India Company were also what you call surveyors. Okay, meaning like they were like land surveyors, right? They surveyed the land, they drew up maps. Okay, so the sketches and drawings which they did okay, was uh, more a kind of a form of uh, documentation okay, rather than, uh, you know, I would say, an, an, you know, artistic you know, creations in, in that sense. Okay, but nonetheless, I, I think they, they, they are still important. I mean, they are an important record okay, of early Singapore. Right? And I'm not saying that they are without merit. In fact, uh, you know, some, of the, some of these works were quite outstanding as well. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, perhaps one of the most well-known you know, um, figures in the, in the 19th century, and that's J.T. Thompson. Okay? And J.T. stands for John Turnbull Thompson. Now, John Turnbull Thom Thompson was, um, you know, he came to Singapore, you know, as, uh, you know, and he, um, he was, in fact, appointed what you call government surveyor at the age of about 21. Okay. And his job was, uh, he acted both as a surveyor, that means, that's to say he, uh, he mapped out the town, okay, um, and, and you know, he, his other task was as an engineer, okay, so he also built bridges, right, uh, he also constructed buildings, okay, and he has left a legacy in Singapore. Now, anyone knows uh, which buildings in Singapore were, you know, done by the hands of J.T. Thompson? Sorry? Victoria Memorial Hall. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe not. Okay, the Dalhousie Memorial. That's one. Okay, he also designed the steeple of the first version of St. Andrew's Cathedral. Right? And of course, you know, the road today, what you call Thompson Road, is named after him. Right? Okay, and um, so he was, uh, you know, he, he played an important role as well. Uh, you know, in, in, in uh, charting okay, the, the landscape of Singapore, right? And he was an amateur painter, a self-taught painter. Okay, and um, this is uh, one of his work, it's called the Padang. Right? And uh, you can see how different, of course, the Padang was at that time. Now, this is a quote okay, um, by Sir Stamford Raffles. Now, this is the usual quote that I would say, um, you know, uh, uh, the colonial powers would, would say. It's a typical statement, you know, the kind of, uh, we are more enlightened than you, right? Okay? We are the most civilized, you know, uh, uh, people and, you know, our task is to educate you. Okay? But in, in this particular quote, you know, he kind of, um, I suppose, uh, um, says that, well, you know, uh, one of the, the areas that, uh, of education okay, um, that the British can implement right, in the colonies is that of the arts. Okay, so he specifically mentioned, I mean, in the last line you can see that you know, he has mentioned literature and the arts. Okay, but the first art instructor from England, Richard Walker, only came in 1923. That's pretty late, <laughs> right? That's pretty late. Um, okay, Richard Walker. Who is Richard Walker? Right? Now, Richard Walker, um, 
you know, he came and he was appointed the art master of the British English schools. Right, which means, and he was later, later promoted to become art superintendent. Okay. Um, and, but I think he was most um, well known for being, you know, for being the, the teacher in Raffles Institution, the art teacher, right? And he was uh, also responsible for organizing art classes in Raffles Institution. Okay, and um, one of his most famous pupils is Lim Cheng Ho, the watercolorist, okay, whose work we are going to see later on. Um, as an artist, uh, Richard Walker, you know, he, you can see that in, in the few works that we have of, of him right, in Singapore, you can see that he actually responds to the local environment. Right? Um, you know, and his works are a sensitive rendering of, uh, of of, of light conditions here, right, in the tropics. Um, you know, in one of his work called Epiphany, it's like a mural-sized work, okay. Um, you know, he kind of depicted um, the Virgin Mary as an Asian woman, right. Okay, so he also adapted to the, I suppose, the local conditions. And in 1949, he became the first, one of the co-founders of the Singapore Art Society. It was a very important society. It was, in fact, the first multicultural society in Singapore. Okay, so this is a, 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 the depiction of uh, Kusu Island. As you know, Kusu Island is a place of pilgrimage, right? Where I think during uh, certain uh, occasions, uh, you know, uh, pilgrims would uh, congregate, you know, on Kusu Island, where there's a temple there. Oh, sure. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, next we have the arrival of the Chinese migrant artists. Right? Now, I mean, the question that we can ponder today is whether there's a distinctive Singaporean style in terms of painting, right? You know, I, I'm not sure. Okay, maybe, maybe after today's, uh, you know, uh, talk, right, you can, you can ponder that question more. Um, so, we have the arrival of the Chinese migrant artists who started to arrive in the 1920s. And what happened in China actually also affect or affected what happened here. Okay, because um, some of the artists who arrived here had already been exposed to Western art in China, right, arising from what they call the May 4th Movement, 1919. Now, the May 4th Movement was a kind of political movement that sought to modernize and strengthen China through cultural reform. And um, many artists, uh, in fact, went to Europe to study art. Okay, so when they went back to China, you know, you know um, they actually injected you know, fresh impetus into Chinese art. Okay, so the artists who came to Singapore, right, who eventually settled down here, right, were actually trained in both you know, traditional ink painting as well as Western art. Right. And um, some of these early Chinese artists came here, they participated in exhibitions. Um, you know, and we have some of the famous artists, Chinese artists who actually came here, like Xi Pei Hong, right? Um, and people like that. Okay, but they also came to raise funds for the anti-war efforts in China, because at that time China Right, was fighting the Japanese. Right. Um, so some of the, the Chinese migrant art, uh, artists actually settled in Singapore permanently, and many of them ended up teaching in the Chinese middle schools. Okay, and um, the Society of Chinese Artists was formed in 1935. Now you'll notice that you know, some of these um, early societies, they are ethnic based. Okay? So you have the Society of Chinese Artists, you also have the Society of Malay Artists, and all that. So, as I mentioned earlier on, the Singapore Art Society was the first multicultural right, art society in Singapore. And of course, you know, uh, you know, this was to, this led to the, um, you know, the, 
the founding of uh, the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, okay, which is the oldest institution here in Singapore. Um, and it was uh, founded in 1938 by Lim Hak Tai. Okay, Lim Hak Tai was an alumni of the, the so-called the Xiamen, right, the Xiamen Academy of Art in China. Okay, he was also a teacher in the in a teacher trainings college in Jimei, right, in China. Okay, so he had that kind of education background before he, you know, he, he sort of established uh, NAFA. Okay. Now, the curriculum of NAFA was based on the model of art academies in Shanghai. Okay, because many of the artists who came here, okay, were actually from Shanghai. Okay, they have been exposed to the, you know, the Shanghai um, art system, okay, which itself, I, I believe, was a combination of both, you know, Chinese and Western traditions. Okay, and among the early ink paint, painting teachers at NAFA were Wu Saiyan and Si Hyang To. Now Si Hyang To, you know, not much is known about him, but he's, he's a significant painter. Right? He, um, he was uh, an accomplished painter and calligrapher. Right? He was a painter mostly of uh, birds and flowers, okay? but he was thought to have uh, very masterful brushstrokes. Okay? And Wu Saiyan, Right. Anyone familiar with Wu Saiyan? Hmm. Right, some of you are. Okay. Um, Wu Saiyan was um, the first, I don't know whether it's the only, but the first finger painter right, in Malaya. Okay. And his uh, works uh, at that time were even shown in uh, Europe and America. Um, I believe you know, the, the museum here has uh, quite a number of his works. Right. If you look at his painting, although he painted with a finger, right, you know, he was, uh, you can see that he was very familiar with the literati, the scholars, you know, um, you know, uh, tradition of painting. Okay, like this particular example, okay, called pine tree. Okay, as you know, pine tree is uh, frequently depicted in Chinese art. Okay, it's an evergreen tree. It's um, a symbol of longevity, right? And here you can see how Wu Saiyan, you know, um, attempted to capture the nuances of the pine tree. For example, you know, if you look at the trunk, you know, it, it tries to portray both the tenacity and, or rather contrast the tenacity and strength of the, of the trunk with the delicacy and the softness of the leaves. Right? And he was able to do it quite masterfully in this, uh, in this painting in Singapore. Yeah. Any, any views here whether you think painting is dead in Singapore? Anyone? You all, you all agree that painting, by your silence, I think you agree that painting is dead. Okay. I mean, if you just look at the recently concluded Singapore Biennale, right? I mean, the Biennale itself is, uh, the idea of the Biennale, you know, is antagonistic, I would say, to the idea of painting. Although you, you see a few works there, but normally in international biennales, you know, you don't see that many paintings being exhibited, okay? Because uh, unless you know those paintings are considered to be cutting edge themselves, right? Okay, so yes, you're right. I mean, you know, the, the general feeling. I mean, not only general feeling. I mean, you know, it's true that you know, I mean, just by looking at exhibitions around you today, okay? I mean, we can just count how many exhibitions there are dedicated to painting. All right. But I won't say that painting is dead, right? Maybe dead is not the word to use, all right? It has declined somewhat, okay? But it has not disappeared, okay? It has not died, certainly not, okay? I would say far from it. Okay, in fact, um, artists, oh, by the way, this is the painting by Esmond Lowe, the 70 year old boy. He was trying to, I mean, this painting is a self-portrait, okay? But through that, he's trying to um, um, uh, comment on the, the stressful education that we have in Singapore, right? Okay, where he himself as a student experienced a kind of uh, loss of direct direction and a kind of burnout, right? Okay, as I said, there are still many good artists around, good painters rather, around. Okay, and some of these painters have tried to reinvent the language of painting. Okay, I, I shall quickly go through the six paintings and then, right, we'll end. David Chan, okay, who, um, you know, um, in his early paintings, 
right, he's already been in the art scene for 10 years. And uh, in his early paintings, he um, paints um, a lot of animals. Okay, because he used animals as a critique for the kind of ge genetic um, engineering okay, that, that we are doing today where we kind of uh, exploit animals okay, for our own benefit. Right? Okay, for example, the pig. Right? Um, you know, the pig, uh, they, were, they have been carrying out experiments to, to grow organs in a pig that could match human organs. Okay, I don't know whether they have been successful. Okay? So as to prevent a kind of rejection you know, of, of um, you know, uh, animal organs when transplanted onto human beings. But David Chan said there's a kind of uh, irony here. There's an irony. Irony because you know, the, the, you know, the pig has been considered to be, or at least parts of it has been considered to be delicacy in Chinese cuisine. Right? Okay, but yet here it's being used for medical research to help those all right, who have eaten the pig before. Right? So there's a kind of irony here. I mean, his works always have a kind of a sense of humor, but there's a, a serious underlying message below. Right? So here you can, see, you can see a fork, but instead of a knife, it's actually a scalpel. A scalpel. And you can see the pig there playing with um, tomato. Right? And uh, you know, it's oblivious. The pig is simply oblivious. It's just playing. It's, it's oblivious to its fate. Okay? Either way, it loses out. Okay? Either as food, or you know, for medical research, right? So his uh, his painting is always very fun to look at, right? He's still very much active today, right? David Chan. Uh, he has also gone into uh, making sculptures as well today. My colleague in La Salle, Yan Wu. Okay, he is um, really a pure painter. Okay, when I call him a pure painter, it means uh, he he's simply interested in exploring, you know, the relationship between uh, the formal qualities of the painting, right? Um, the lines, the brush strokes, texture, color, etc. Okay? And um, Ian Wu's painting might seem very chaotic and messy, okay? but there's an underlying coherence and structure in his painting. Okay? I think this uh, title is very apt, The Curtain. Okay? I'm not sure whether the, the black veil on the right refers to the curtain. Okay? But if you look at this painting itself, you can see like it's like a stage. Okay, and all the different uh, you know, lines and, and colors, smudges and all that you see in the painting are actors on the stage. Right? Okay, and I suppose the, the kind of the, the yellow, you know, soon like you know, uh, uh, gesture on the left and the black veil on the, on the right, they can be considered to be the main actors. Right, in this stage itself. Okay? So Ian Wu, you know, I mean, he's a really you know, an established artist today, you know, still very much um, dedicated okay, to, you know, to, to the painting craft. Right? 